Okay class, so this is part two of chapter one in Dental Materials 116. And we just finished the um, portion on history. So I'm not a dentist. Why should I learn all of this about the dental materials we study in this class? And first of all, the dental assistant is directly responsible for the delivery of dental materials. The hygienist must understand how to properly care for the material once it's been placed. Um, the auxiliary must understand the potential hazards um, as they store, manipulate, dispose of the material, and they need to be trained how to properly handle them safely. And it's often the auxiliary's role to advise the patient as to the dentist's recommendation for a particular restorative material. <clears throat> So quite often, a patient will feel more comfortable speaking with you as an auxiliary than they will the dentist, and the dentist should be able to rely on you to have a thorough understanding of, uh, pardon me, of the materials and um, how they work, the way they work, and all that. Okay, dental materials are classified in three ways. Uh, we have preventive materials, restorative materials, and therapeutic. Preventive would be, um, you know, we rely mainly on fluoride as our preventive material. We have sealants as preventive materials, mouth guards, night guards. Uh, they've come out with xylitol and then some of these nice new MI paste um, that uh, provide calcium and phosphorus in um, a, a very bioavailable form so that the teeth are um, happy to absorb the calcium and phosphorus so that they can be strengthened. Ha actually helps to reverse demineral demineralization. Mm. Pardon me? Okay, then of course restorative materials, which we spend a, a lot of time on, would be amalgam, composite, uh, materials that would be part of creating crowns and bridges. Therapeutic m materials would be m materials such as fluoride, which um, has like a, um, a therapeutic effect. It, it calms down dental sensitivity. Um, when, for example, if you for if you have a re gentle recession, um, the the fluoride then would be therapeutic or something such as um, IRM, um, which which would calm the nerve down. Um, IRM has a product is is really a derivative of oil of clove, and it has a therapeutic benefit to it. Now, ideally, the dental material should be biocompatible, must adhere, oh my gosh. <sighs> ideally, dental materials should be biocompatible. They should adhere to the tooth structure that they've been placed in. They ought to be aesthetic. Um, at times, um, well, what we want them to do is actually repair the tooth structure which has become damaged or decayed. And uh, there are times when dental materials can actually help regenerate uh, tissue, dental tissue. And then, of course, we want to restore the function. So with all the products that are out there, how can we know that a particular dental material will live up to the manufacturer's claims? You recall that I mentioned to you the idea of that uh, traveling salesman, that person who could just as easily be a, a huckster, someone who could be selling snake oil, would also be performing dental uh, treatments. And um, uh, and so the um, mm, edit. Okay, trying to get back to my thoughts. So edit to here. So the um, what we what we need is for someone to uh, self-regulate, and dentistry has done quite a bit of that self-regulation. Some of the agencies that have been established to maintain standards that can be. Um, relied upon are um, the American Society of Dental Surgeons back in 1839. They were established to, um, 
to agree on some basic standards. In 1859, the ADA, which is still um, functioning today, was established. And you will recognize the ADA seal of acceptance. It used to be the ADA seal of approval. But that seal is placed on products that have been So the American Dental Association seal of acceptance is placed on products that have been studied at great length. They have been tested in labs and they have been shown to perform as up to the advertised, what they have advertised. So they are a very um, great resource in our field to, you know, to, to know that we're providing for our patients the, what the manufacturer says they are providing. And then the Food and Drug Administration is also, um, they have uh, some function there as well where, uh, depending on the classification, if something is, uh, you know, toothpaste, then it's not, um, you know, really regulated by the FDA. If something is more critical, there is a higher scrutiny. And then things that are quite critical such as um, bone augmentation materials, materials that are implanted in um, you know, uh, the, the, within the bone itself, and those are highly regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. And then there are some international agencies, the International Dental Federation and the ISO, the International Standards Organization. And those are all agencies which monitor and self Well, this is self-regulating, and this is government regulating uh, our industry and the manufacture of dental materials. Now, uh, when a particular dentist decides which dental materials to use, there's a, a of, I don't know exactly how to say it, there's something called evidence-based decision-making. And the dentist is um, bases his decisions on three different uh, domains. One is the best available scientific evidence. So information, say, from the ADA tests, information on dentalproducts.com, uh, all, all the... Um, there are different organizations which test and test and test and provide scientific evidence for a particular product. Now the dentist's own clinical skill and judgment is really important here because there's always a new whiz-bang product being put forward on the market. Uh, it's how our, our society works we, with a capitalistic society. Uh, new products are always being placed on the market to meet the need, uh, become create better, stronger, faster uh, m materials for dentistry. However, if a dentist is biting at every piece of bait that's placed in the water if he, um, and trying this new product and that new product, first of all, it takes up a lot of the dentist's time to learn a new product. In addition to that, you know, it's just like if you ladies have um, a drawer full of makeup, for example, that you started with this lip color and then you went to that one and then you've got, you know, three tubes of different mascara and blush and the rest. So you've got tons of money spent on products that are just sitting there in the drawer. And so that's another uh, factor uh, that the dentist is going to do some research choose materials that they feel like best meet their patient's needs and then they're going to likely stick with that for a long time. They, if, they're, if they're wise, they're going to find the best and stick with it. Uh, of course, the best at an affordable price for their practice. And then ultimately, the patient's needs and preferences are, have to be taken into account. So when all three of those domains, uh, science, the dentist's own skill and judgment, the patient's needs and preferences are taken into account, that's when we have evidence-based decision-making. Um, so if we think of the scientific evidence, the clinical judgment, and the patient's needs as three circles, then 
evidence-based decision-making is right here where those circles intersect. Okay, so it's only when all three are due, given due consideration in individual patient care is uh, evidence-based decision-making actually being practiced. In summary, dental materials have made dramatic strides since the dawn of civilization. Materials continue to be developed, evaluated, and monitored. The market is driven by the unceasing demand for better products, and that demand is met by innovative companies. These are all monitored by the ADA, FDA, and ISO. And all this to restore 32 relatively small teeth in a challenging oral environment.